This episode is brought to you by Charles Schwab. Decisions made in Washington affect your portfolio every day. But what policy changes should investors be watching? Washington Wise is an original podcast for investors from Charles Schwab. This podcast unpacks the stories making news in Washington and how they may affect your finances and portfolio. Listen at schwab.com slash Washington Wise. So, Jeremy, if I was going to ask you what your SAT scores were, would you remember them? I certainly would. Do you want to share? So, I, yes, I got an 1800, and unfortunately, my, the mathematics score dragged me down. Jeremy Bauerwolf reports on college admissions for Higher Ed Dive. And I promise I was not asking him to tell me his SAT scores just so I could clown him. When you got your SAT score, did you feel some kind of way about it? Were you like, Ugh. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. It was something that I felt like was hinging on my future, right? We put so much pressure on students, and it, and it comes down to this one score. And, you know, that can sometimes you know, discount their entire academic record. I was asking Jeremy about his SAT scores because I feel like we're at this moment where the meaning of the SAT is changing. All that anxiety people used to feel about these tests, anxiety Jeremy felt, anxiety I felt, it seems to be melting away just a bit. New at six, Columbia University is dropping standardized test requirements for undergraduate admissions. So that means This is partially because fewer and fewer colleges are requiring these tests. These are a couple of standardized tests that have been a rite of passage and a source of anxiety for students for decades. And now this whole test optional trend is catching on big time. It's our original... Earlier this month, after putting standardized testing on hold for the pandemic, Columbia University became the first Ivy League school to go test optional forever. Jeremy doesn't think this elite institution is going to be the last. So... Columbia, along with the rest of the Ivy League, has been in sort of this holding pattern where they've been extending their test optional policies. I mean, Harvard just did it through the class of 2030. And I think it will cause others to follow. You're saying like once an, once an institution decides no SAT, there's kind of no going back? I mean, once folks get into a rhythm and they get used to seeing, well, I don't really need a test score to read this particular application, Why would you want to go back, especially if there's documented benefits? I feel like I'm used to thinking of SATs as like a weird bit of validation. Like I have this really strong memory of how in the early days of Amazon, Jeff Bezos would ask every potential employee what their SAT scores were. Like they just became this thing that lived in people's mind, like rent free. In 2023, do the SATs still have this power? I would say it's diminished. There have been some really hard strikes against the SAT and the college board as a whole, and it really has come with the test optional and test free movement. Today on the show, college admissions is changing, and not just because of these tests. So, how'd we get here? I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next. Stick around. This episode is brought to you by Charles Schwab. Decisions made in Washington affect your portfolio every day. But what policy changes should investors be watching? Listen to Washington Wise, an original podcast for investors from Charles Schwab, to hear the stories making news right now. Hosted by Mike Townsend, Charles Schwab's Managing Director for Legislative and Regulatory Affairs, Washington Wise takes a nonpartisan look at the stories that matter most to investors. Tune in to learn about the policy initiatives for retirement savings, taxes, and trade. Hear about inflation fears, the Federal Reserve, and how regulatory developments can affect companies, sectors, and even the entire market. Mike and his guests offer their perspective on how policy changes could affect what you do with your portfolio. Download the latest episode and follow at schwab.com slash WashingtonWise or wherever you're listening right now. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. 
Most of you hearing my voice right now are probably multitasking. Yep, even while you're listening, you are probably driving, cleaning, exercising, maybe grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there is something else you could be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year. So you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts are not available in all states and situations. The College Board has been administering admissions tests for more than 100 years. But the SAT, that came on the scene in 1926. That's when the Scholastic Aptitude Test was first developed by a professor at Princeton. His name was Carl Brigham, and he based it on an aptitude test that he actually crafted for the military. So even in the earliest stages, we can kind of hardly see where the controversy is coming in because Brigham was a eugenicist. He took the results of his army test to conclude that, you know, white people would perform better on tests. Jeremy Bauerwolf says that within a decade, the SAT was required for admission to Harvard. Eventually, this requirement spread to the entire Ivy League and beyond. You know, when the Ivy League does something, the sector pays attention for better or for worse. And that still held true back then. So it really started, like I said, take off after World War II or around the 60s. That I said colleges really began to pick it up and it would really be considered that ubiquitous standing that we see now. I was surprised by how long there's been pushback to the SAT. Like back in the 1969, 1970, Bowdoin College in Maine went test optional. And I just thought like that that was a while ago. Yeah, it certainly was. And there's a reason for that. I mean, from the very beginning, high test scores were correlated with being wealthy, white, having parents who have advanced degrees. And so the same sorts of lines of criticism that you see now were were present back then. And I think they were even more evident, right? So there's an infamous question on the SAT that involves, you know, identifying analogy and and using the word regatta. Like a boat race. Yeah, exactly. And it's something that wealthier white students would like sort of immediately recognize over their counterparts. And again, this question, there's no evidence that it's been ever used again. This was, you know, decades ago. But it sort of like speaks to the criticism, right? Because like you said, this has been going on for a really long time. And there's probably reasons for that. Why didn't other colleges follow suit in rejecting the SAT after this pretty elite college in Maine said, yeah, we don't need this? Well, for a long time, SATs and ACT scores were a huge part of the U.S. News and World Report rankings, which which colleges tend to value. And also, you know, colleges tend not to make moves that are not in their best interest, and they do so super slowly. So, you know, Bowdoin, as you said, that's one fairly prominent liberal arts institution, but it doesn't reflect something like a Michigan state or another major public system, for instance. And so I think that colleges had no reason to to get rid of the SAT. It was sort of working fine for them for a really long time, even with that outside criticism. How did COVID change things? Because it feels like things were kind of bumping along and people would raise questions about the SAT. But I feel like what's happened over the last three years has been so sudden. Yeah, it really pushed it into overdrive, right? So... I'm reported out on this, you actually saw similar institution types. So let's take the Ivy League, for instance, announcing within days of each other that they were going test optional. So again, when the pandemic shuttered everything, those K-12 schools, they're all gone. What are we going to do? And when one school makes a move, 
the others are followed. So again, if you're looking at the Ivy League, that happened within days of each other. If you're looking at public flagship institutions, that happened within weeks of each other. And it was so quick. And I think people were a little bit thrown off because up until this point, you know, there were like periodic updates on test optional. You know, University of Chicago, that's a, a very prominent institution. It was test optional several years ago. That made news. But a lot of the test optional policies, they still rested at those open access community college institutions. So, you know, really in a matter of weeks, you have the pandemic sort of flipping admissions on its head. Um, and I, I think that was really the shock value there. And pretty much all of the institutions that have been grappling with the SAT, they've gone test optional at this point, right? Either permanently or temporarily, which means now that things are open again, you can take the SAT. It's just not required that you take it. Is that right? That's exactly right. Test optional is not a wholesale rejection of tests by colleges, right? It's giving students who, you know, may have had a poor score the opportunity to skip that part. It doesn't mean that high scoring students can't still submit their scores and, you know, really get something out of that and potentially gain admission. It just means that there's another avenue open here. Although there are some institutions that are going test free or test blind, which means they refuse to consider tests whatsoever. Yeah, about a little more than a year ago, we did a show about the UC system in California and how they were ending the use of the SAT in admissions. And that feels different to me. That's like saying we won't look at this. That's test blind. But that's not what's happening generally or even at Columbia right now, right? Correct. Test blind, test free is very narrow. There's few institutions outside, you know, the California systems, which does represent a big market and Caltech and, you know, a a few other select institutions. But again, across the board, mostly test optional. Now that so many colleges have been test optional for a while, like I think it's 1,800 this year, how is that changing the demographics of who's applying? Well, it's hard to know. You hear anecdotal evidence, and and I have spoken to admissions officers that said, you know, we've had flurries of applications. You know, we've seen some of our enrollment pools change a little bit. But in terms of hard data, we actually don't have a ton of research on this. But there is such a study, a massive study underway with the Admissions Association with money from the Gates Foundation. So we should know more definitively about how test optional changes, you know, applicant and enrollment pools a little bit down the road. Yeah, I mean, it seems important because for so long, The SAT has been tied up in this larger debate about what education is and who it's for. Like, it's about equity. But I sort of wonder when I look at test optional, or you could submit your scores, or you could choose not to, whether that really does anything for equity. Because the schools get to choose how they use the scores, and the students who do well still get to use them. So. I don't know that it's going to change anything in regards to like the major criticism of the test, which is, as you said, the guy who created it was a eugenicist. Like this actually might not touch that, even though it sort of sounds like it will. Yeah. And look, test optional is sometimes looked at this as a silver bullet. and It's just really not the case. Right. It's one way of potentially improving campus equity. But of course, you know, making a test optional doesn't fix these racist structures that we have in admissions. There's all these other hurdles, too, that colleges need to address. And test optional policies are just not occurring in a vacuum. You know, they they really took off around the same time George Floyd's death and the racial reckoning in the country. So I think it is really hard to pinpoint that, you know, oh, this is going to increase your diversity by X much. I don't think we can say that, but I also don't think that we can say there's evidence that it causes any sort of harm. It's funny because having the SAT be so important, like loom so large in people's heads, I feel like we've talked about how that can be problematic. But when I was thinking about it, I was also thinking about how in some ways it was useful. Like once the SAT was clearly so salient to college admissions, there was a huge push to make sure all kinds of kids were 
prepped for the test, make sure the test was given during school hours as opposed to over the weekend, separate sites so that, you know, all kids could access the test, all those sorts of things. Like there were there were efforts to make the test equitable as problematic as it was. And I do wonder a little bit with so many places going test optional, whether the test will kind of become even less equitable because there'll be less pressure to make this thing salient to everyone. Well, I want to say we should look at where that pressure is coming from, right? So for instance, you referenced the idea that more students now are taking the SAT during the school day. Well, why is that? Well, that's because in some cases, the College Board has very lucrative contracts with states, right? And so the College Board has a very clear interest in promoting a product that makes them money. So, you, you know, yes, maybe taking the SAT during the school day would help some select students. But, you know, it's not necessarily the equity measure that it's being presented as, right? In many cases, it would actually benefit the person who's giving the test. I'm really glad you brought up the way the SAT and the people who administer at the College Board like that's a business and it's a pretty big business. Is it a healthy business? I would say it is much less healthy than it was several years ago because of the decline in revenue from the SAT. The net program service revenues, which is what it earns from overseeing the SAT, in the calendar year 2020 fell by $286 million compared to 2019. That is a huge chunk of change. They're, they're worried right now. There's a, there's a real push right now. After the break, the SAT might be fading from prominence, but the college board wants to hang on. How's it going to do that? Jeremy Bauerwolf says that behind the scenes, as the pandemic dragged on and colleges started rethinking their relationship with testing, the College Board did not sit idly by. Instead, they started lobbying hard to keep using the SAT in admissions decisions. Jeremy's seen the letters where they argue that getting rid of these tests would be bad for students. But the College Board knows change is coming and they are trying to manage it. In truth, they have been trying to manage change for a while now, responding to those allegations that the tests they administer have bias baked in. Sometimes these efforts have succeeded. Sometimes they've failed. Like in 2019, when the College Board announced they would be giving each student an adversity score, a numerical rank from 1 to 100, that was supposed to gauge how much hardship a student had experienced, based on things like their school environment and neighborhood poverty and crime rates. They abandoned that plan very quickly because it was an attempt to sort of capture, you know, the socioeconomic profile of students with this single score. Feels like a scarlet letter. It, it, it really did. It really did for a lot of students. And it, it just can't be summed up in a single score, right? It's trying to boil down all these complicated metrics and some, you know, that students feel shame for it to a single score. So it was very quickly on its way out the door. I can tell you that it almost immediately was discontinued. And that's a rarity for the College Board. If you look at their history, they've faced criticism on a number of different fronts. You know, almost never did they sort of bow to those critics. And the, the adversity score really was one of those times where sort of this unanimous voice saying, what are you doing? Huh. <laughs> So now, post-pandemic, the College Board is trying something else with the SAT, like a digital SAT. Why is that a big deal? Well, the SAT is going to be starting be delivered digitally in the U.S. starting in 2024, right? And so the College Board here, it's touting the simplicity, this accessibility. But again, the main thrust of the criticism against the SAT is that the questions sometimes in themselves can be biased, right? I think there's a great example that I encountered in my reporting when I was talking to a tutor who primarily works with disadvantaged students. And after a single session, and keep in mind that this tutor wasn't teaching content, 
She was teaching the student how to actually read the test, right? Look at those trick questions, et cetera, et cetera. That student who had an abysmal SAT score, it shot up by several hundred points, right? Whoa. So I think that should give us pause, right? You know, after one session, a student does better without learning any new material. It means you're learning a trick. It means you're learning a trick. And that, again, is the main problem with the SAT that folks consider, right, is that the questions themselves are written toward a particular audience. Some people have speculated that if the College Board can't make the SAT popular again by changing the test itself, they might just shift their focus entirely and center their business around the Advanced Placement, or AP, program, which they also run. The AP program offers college-level courses to high school students. But Jeremy says focusing on AP classes is not going to fix the College Board's equity problem. Obviously, there are more advanced placement opportunities at wealthier schools. And again, those schools are catering to a particular demographic. So are we just going to have the same haves and have-nots in sort of a different form? I think we have yet to see how that will play out a little bit. But if there's more emphasis on the advanced placement in California, we're sort of back where we started. It's funny that you frame the AP program as sort of a backup plan for the College Board. I'm not saying you're wrong. I just think it's interesting because I've heard for a couple years now from friends in education that people have been kind of given the side eye to the AP program for a variety of reasons. And then, of course, just this spring, we saw how Florida you know, got into this big public fight with the College Board over AP African-American studies. Tonight, the College Board unveiling a new framework for advanced placement African-American studies after pressure from critics to not include topics like Black Lives Matter and sexual orientation. A critique many and so I feel like the advanced placement program is not protected from all these fights that the SAT has gotten involved with, you know, about race, about who education is for, equity, all these things. It's interesting, right? Because I think you could apply that same sort of side-eye criticism to both of the College Board products, and yet we still used them, right? So, of course, there's going to be criticisms of advanced placement in terms of, well, are they distributed equitably? You know, the College Board is developing this curriculum. Is it something that matches the school's mission that is offering it, right? But how do you disentangle something like the advanced placement program from K-12 schools and then into colleges? I don't see a path forward for that, at least not immediately. You mean because it's so rooted in right now? Yeah, exactly right. You know, students, they look for advanced placement courses because they want to get college credit. Of course, why wouldn't they? And so a high school unless they are resource strapped, very likely isn't going to scale back their advanced placement just because there's this criticism in the background. As I was getting ready for this interview, I was thinking about how something that's happening at the same time as so many universities are shifting away from the SAT is that there's this big case in front of the Supreme Court about affirmative action. Many think the court could overturn the use of race in admissions. And to me, I look at that and I just think, huh, like SAT not really so prominent, race less of a factor. It feels like admissions, it's not being turned upside down, but it's certainly changing a lot all at once. When you speak to people who are in the admissions system, do they see it that way? Yeah, I think so. There are a lot of conversations now about these, what we perceive as mainstays in college admissions that, you know, might be weakened or altogether gone down the road. I think legacy admissions is a really interesting discussion that's being having right now. Some people call it like affirmative action for rich people, essentially. Oh, yeah, exact, and exactly right. It overwhelmingly favors white and wealthy applicants. 
And we're just sort of just starting to see hints of the policy movement on legacy admissions. So during that Supreme Court case on race conscious admissions, which I actually attended, during the oral arguments, the Solicitor General indicated the federal government would support restricting legacy admissions. For a a place like Harvard, where a huge contingent of their accepted students come from legacy background, that's a cause for concern. Yeah. I wonder if you sit back and imagine what college admissions are going to look like in a decade and how it's different than it is now. Colleges are going to have to adapt. They're going to have to be clearer. You know, when I talked to some admissions folks, you know, several months ago, they were saying that colleges have done a really poor job explaining what college admissions is. And I think that's probably true. I think there needs to be some demystifying, right? It's interesting because I think what you're saying is in the world where everyone took the SAT and it was required to get into college, you as a student at least had some idea of where you stood. Like you knew like, I got a 1600, maybe I should apply to Harvard. I don't know. Like I have a shot there. You had, because you had the score yourself. But in this new world where the SAT is a little like, eh, maybe it's not going to happen. Like maybe you don't need to submit it. You sort of send things in on a wing and a prayer. And, (laughs) you know, there are certainly metrics the college is using, but you don't have any sense of that either before or after. Yep, exactly right. You know, folks think because they have sort of gone through this process in a way, they've taken the SAT, they've sent it in, they've gotten accepted into college. Well, I know that that high SAT score got me into school. That's what really what carried me. No, you don't. You don't know that. And so there, again, there are a lot of different factors that are happening behind the scenes. I'm not saying that Penn State is going to let us into their reading sessions for applications, but I do think that there is going to be a new degree of transparency. Jeremy, I'm super grateful for your time. Thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Jeremy Bauerwolf is a senior reporter at Higher Ed Dive. And that's our show. If you're a fan of what we're doing, the best way to show us some love is to go on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus and figure out how to sign up for Slate Plus. It's our membership program. You get all kinds of great benefits. It's completely worth it. Go check it out now. What Next is produced by Elena Schwartz, Anna Phillips, Paige Osborne, and Madeline Ducharme. We are getting a ton of support right now from Jared Downing and Laura Spencer. We're led by Alicia Montgomery with a little help from Susan Matthews. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations here at Slate. And I'm Mary Harris. I'm handing things off to Lizzie O'Leary and the What Next TBD crew. They're going to be here tomorrow and Sunday, helping you figure out everything you need to know in the wake of this Silicon Valley bank failure. All right. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you Monday.